Genesis 37. Let's get into it right now, into the scripture. So Joseph went after his brothers and he found them at Dothan, right? Means what? Laws and customs. And when they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, what happens? They plotted against him to put him to death. Some of your translations say they conspired to murder him. This is exactly what was going on with Jesus. And why did they do that? Because it was envy. It says in the scriptures in John, the book of John, it says that Pilate knew it was because of envy that they delivered him over to him. Wow, this is so, the parallels are amazing, are they not? So they plotted to put him to death when they saw Joseph drawing near. And they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now, then come and let's kill him and throw him to him into one of these pits. So here comes this dreamer, they mockingly said, right? When those religious leaders were around the cross, and it's recorded in the Old Testament in Psalm 22, it was like David was looking through the eyes of Jesus on the cross 1,000 years before he was born, and seeing the mockers, it says they scoffed at me and they mocked at me and they wagged their heads at me. That's exactly what John recorded they were doing around the cross to Jesus. And it's recorded in Matthew too in the other gospels. They mocked Jesus in that same way. And this is just powerful that we're seeing this in Joseph's story as well. 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. Wow. All right, let's get back into the presentation. Now then, come and let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits, they said about Joseph. And we will say a vicious animal devoured him. So their plan is to lie. Now that's a very interesting scripture right there. Why? Because we know that in the Jewish tradition, the the rabbis, after years and years and hundreds of years, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, went off to the Father to be at the right hand of the Father, and the church began to grow all over in Jerusalem and throughout the world, the text was changed in Psalm 22, okay? Because it says in Psalm 22, they, they pierced or bore through my hands and my feet. And that was in the oldest manuscripts, which were the Septuagint, right? But then it was changed to like a lion's paw. You know, like a lion's paw, they, they cut through my, my hands, it pierced my hands and feet, like a lion's paw. So let's go back to this in, in Joseph's story. What did his brothers say among themselves? What was their lie, right? This was the lie that they wanted to come up with as, there, as there's a picture of Jesus being arrested and beaten and stripped of his tunic. And this is what their plan was. It says right here, and we will say a vicious animal devoured him. Whoa, doesn't that not remind you of what Psalm 22 was changed to? Like a lion's paw. They pawed at my, cut through my hands and my feet. No, that's not it. It's bore through or pierced through my hands and feet in Psalm 22. There's no other, no other interpretation. That's the right one. That's the oldest one. So let's continue on. Then we, will, then we will see what will become of his dreams. Does that not sound like the mocking around Jesus recorded in Psalm 22 and in the Gospels when he was going, when he was at the cross? This is a picture of Jesus at the cross and his arrest. This is what we're seeing right here, you guys. And then it continues, but Reuben, his oldest brother, right? The firstborn of Jacob, Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands by saying, let's not take his life. Now that might seem at first like Reuben was the hero here, the good brother, and that he was trying to save Joseph. But I don't think so because the scripture shows us that he was just trying to rescue him to return him to his father. That was his real motive to get in with the, to look good to the father because he goes along with this lie. This lie that will say a, a wild animal devoured him. He went along with that. So he was not in good standing here, even though it kind of seems like it. So Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands, saying, let's not take his life. 
Then Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and but do not lay a hand on him. So that later he might rescue him out of their hands and return him to his father. So he was, in my opinion, my conjecture on this is that he was trying to look like a hero. And the reason I said that, again, is because he went along with that lie that they went, they said to the father, to Jacob, that, and to Israel, right? That lie that said a wild animal devoured him. That's not what happened. All right, <laughs> we know that. Okay, so let's continue on here. And so it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the multicolored tunic that was on him. Or it could be that long-sleeved and long tunic, or it could mean that seamless tunic that Jesus also had a seamless tunic, right? That the soldiers cast lots for. And that's what we see. So they stripped him of his tunic, you guys. We know this scene right here also happened to Jesus. They did that to him. And it's recorded, you guys, right here in Matthew 27. And they stripped him and put a red cloak on him. This was the Roman soldiers who did this, right? They stripped Jesus. They mocked him. They put a red or a scarlet cloak on Jesus which was like a royal cloak uh, of showing that he was a king or a prince, but they did that in a mocking way. So we see in this right now, Jesus, we see the scourging, we see his own brethren selling him down the road, falsely accusing him, mocking him. We see the Romans mocking him, stripping him of his tunic. This is a big picture of the cross of Yeshua HaMashiach, if you're in Israel, going to the cross. And then in Genesis 37, it continues, and they took him and they threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. To me, that speaks of the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea gave to Jesus. Because what we're seeing here is a transition. They're about to hand Joseph, Yosef, right, over to the Gentiles. And the religious leaders, the, the, the leaders of Israel, the shepherds of Israel did the same thing. They handed Joseph over to the Gentiles. And they threw him into this pit, right? Well, Joseph of Arimathea gave his tomb, which was not, no dead man had ever been in it, but they threw Jesus' dead body into that tomb. That's where he was put. Just like Joseph was in this cistern or this pit that was in the wilderness, right? He was in that. And that's a picture of Jesus being in the tomb. This is amazing, you guys. The, the, the pictures in this is so, are so good. So they took him and they threw him into the pit. And the pit was empty and without water. So Joseph will be looking up, it would be like this, right? Which is similar to what? Jesus in that tomb, right? The tomb that no dead man had defiled, the one that Joseph of Arimathea gave to him. So that's what we're seeing in this right now. This is amazing, you guys. The pictures are amazing. And then Genesis 37 continues, Then they sat down to eat a meal. So they ate a meal together. What happened when Jesus was crucified? It was during what? Passover. And what happens during Passover? The, the meal, the Passover meal was eaten. Wow. The parallels are so astounding. 2,000 years BC, before Christ, before his birth, this story took place, you guys. The story of Joseph. This is amazing. All right, let's go back into it right now. So here we go. As they sat down to eat a meal. And then Genesis 37 continues, But as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming. These Gentiles, right? These, they were the descendants of the Arabs, actually. And from Gilead, with their camels, they were carrying lebdanum, resin, balsam, and myrrh. Now, why is that important? 
These are embalming ingredients, you guys. These are the ingredients that they used in Egypt to embalm. That's why they're heading there with this, to sell this stuff to the Egyptians, because it was embalming fluid. Now, what happened, especially the myrrh there as we see it, what happened with Jesus? Remember the, the wise men came at his birth? And they what did they bring to Jesus? They brought myrrh, the same thing that these Midianite traders are bringing, these, these Ishmaelites, excuse me, are, are bringing. Let's look at it right now. So this is a myrrh tree, and it is harvested from these today. They still harvest these. And here we're seeing, right, the wise men, what did they bring? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The frankincense was for incense, but also for embalming, and the myrrh was specifically used for embalming a dead body. And that's what happened with Jesus at from his birth. It was shown to us that he was to die. But we see Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus asked for the body of Christ, of the Messiah. And he was a good Pharisee along with Joseph of Arimathea who gave him that tomb. And they took his body. And it says here, Nicodemus who had first come to him by night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. This is stuff that the Jewish people would use to treat the dead body uh, as it was put into the tomb. So that's what we're seeing here. And this is so powerful, you guys. Isn't this amazing? I'm amazed at this. I hope you are too. <laughs> okay. And then we continue on in Joseph's story. And their way was on their way to bring them down to Egypt, right? So... Joseph was brought down to Egypt at this point, right? And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and to cover up his blood? What profit is it for us? Profit as in money, right? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. So here they want to see, he wants to sell his brother and do not lay our hands on him for he is our brother and our flesh. Then his brothers listened to him. They didn't listen to Reuben, but they listened to him. We see that. And some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him out, and they lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels or pieces of silver. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, right? Well, we know here in Joseph's story that 20 shekels of silver is what? It's the price of a slave, right? 20 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Well, did you know that during Jesus' time that 30 pieces of silver or shekels of silver was the price of a slave also? Isn't that amazing? And we know that Judas sold Jesus down the road for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. This is amazing. So they brought Joseph into Egypt. That's what happens after this. Now, I want to go back to Judas real quick because the name Judah from Joseph's story, right? His brother who came up with this plan to sell Joseph for 20 pieces of silver, sell him as a slave. The name Judas derives from the name Judah. Wow. God put all of this together, you guys. And it's right here in these scriptures. This is amazing, you guys. So they brought Joseph into Egypt. So now Joseph, who was a type of Jesus, is now brought down into Egypt, which in the Bible, is a picture and a type of the world. Jesus, after he was crucified and resurrected and the church grew, he, his message, his good news, was brought throughout the whole world. And that's what we're seeing here. That's what happened. And you're going to look at this. Check this out right here. This is amazing. So behind that picture, there is something. And we're going to look at that right now. He was brought... So. Joseph was brought from here in, in the land of Israel, later to become the land of Israel. He brought, they brought him down, and he was brought down here into what is Egypt. So when Jesus, after 70 AD, right, Jesus predicted the, the fall of the temple. He said, not one stone will remain upon another. That's exactly what happened. The Romans destroyed it. It was a horrible thing that happened in 70 AD by this evil general Titus, who later became an emperor. 
and this is the inside of an archway right here. You can see it like this today. It's in Rome. It's still preserved from that time. After Just after 70 AD, they carved out this archway. And what do you see here? The seven golden lampstand, the menorah, the seven golden lampstand that was brought out from that temple during Jesus's time. Here you see the Roman soldiers carrying it out. It's probably a parade to celebrate their uh, defeat in their victory in, in 70 AD, where they destroyed the temple. And here they have the table of showbread. And you can even see the, the cup, the gold cup, which carried the wine. Because the table of showbread had the 12 loaves, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the cup with the wine, which also is a symbol of communion, right? But here we're seeing the seven golden lampstand. Well, what does the book of Revelation what does the book of Revelation tell us, right? What does it tell us about the seven golden lampstand? Well, in chapter one of Revelation, John sees this vision of the, the seven golden lampstand, and there was a one walking among it who was Jesus, Yeshua, our great high priest. He was walking among those seven golden lampstands, and it tells us right there that it represents the church, the seven churches. Wow. That are actually where at that time they were in Asia Minor. These were seven Gentile, mostly Gentile churches. And that's what we're seeing in this picture because after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, this these, these articles of the temple were brought into Rome. And it's this picture of what God did. He brought the church all over the world, the good news of his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, all over the world. But that's not the end of the story. What happens, guys? So it went from Jerusalem to Rome, and the church spread all over the known world at that time, and here down in Africa as well. In fact, I think that might have been one of the first places the gospel went, because remember, Philip found the eunuch that was from Ethiopia, and he went down, and he spread the good news about Jesus down there. But it also went into Rome, and then all over the whole world. The good news of Jesus, the Messiah, you guys. It spread everywhere to the four corners of the world. But what is going to happen in the future? What happened? Israel became a nation again. And God gathered his people, Israel, from the four corners of the world. And they became a nation again in 1948. It was a powerful thing, you guys. And also, Israel is not only a nation, but they're thriving and they're blessed by God. Very blessed. Because it's like that prodigal son story. They came to their senses. I think this happened after World War II, at the Holocaust. Israel finally said, we're better off in our father's land. Just like that prodigal son story in Luke chapter 15. And it is so powerful because in Luke 15, Jesus starts off talking about how the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go rescue that one. What is that one that represents 1%, right? He leaves the 99 to go get rescue that one. The, is, the population of the Jewish people is less than 1% of the world's population. So it's like he's leaving the 99 to go rescue that one, and he's already blessing them as they return to what? The Father's land, just like that prodigal son story. And they're being blessed even before they come fully back into the arms of the Father. But this is happening now. I have friends in Israel who have commented to me on my YouTube videos, some of the believers that are in Israel who believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, the Jesus the Messiah. They've told me that thousands of Jewish people are coming to know their true Messiah. This is so awesome, you guys. This is fulfilling what Romans chapter 11 says because it says that when that full number of Gentiles has come in, what does that mean, come into Christ? Then all of Israel will be saved. That means all of Israel at one moment in time will be saved. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't that touch your heart? It touches mine in a, a great way. I love the Jewish people. I love Israel. That is why I do these videos, because I love them. And I'm not afraid to tell the truth about it. I've had lots of pushback from people in Israel, and I still love them. And I care about them. And if any of you are watching right now, I love you. But more importantly, 
Yeshua loves you. He loves you. And he's waiting for you to come back to him and come back all the way into his arms, into the Father's arms. So, hey, guys, I'm so glad we got to go through this episode on Joseph. I'm excited because we're going to get into it even deeper. We're going one step at a time, verse by verse, chapter by chapter in Genesis 37. We're going to go a little bit into 38 too because there's a powerful picture of what happens to Israel after they reject Yosef, which is like Yeshua, and there's a picture of them leaving, straying away from the Father, from God, and then later, what happens? They come back. They come back, you guys, and they're saved. And Joseph has a Gentile bride when that happens. And it's during a seven-year time of great trouble. So, hey, don't forget, hit this playlist right here, How to Find Jesus in the Old Testament, and you will be blessed by it, my friend. We're going through this together, you and me. I love you guys. Can't wait to get in the next episode. Talk to you later.